Um, so my name is Charlie Lai, and this is my colleague Alex Garcia. We're part of the Google Bay Area Farm to Table group here at Google, and our mission is to promote events and ideas related to food sustainability. And that is why we're very excited today to have two very special guests, um, Kurt Ellis and Sarah Ting, who Alex will now introduce. Thank you. Um, Kurt is the CEO and co-founder of Food Corps, a fast-growing national nonprofit. Food Corps' mission is working together with communities to connect kids to healthy food in school. Um, joining Kurt on stage today is Sarah Ting, who is an alumni of the Food Corps program. So with that, I want to welcome Kurt and Sarah to tell us a little bit more about it. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for coming today. And a uh, huge thanks to Charlie and Alex and my old friend Krista Essig, who's been involved in Food Corps since the earliest days, uh, for hosting us through Google Food. Um, I'd like to start by sharing a little bit of the story that brought me here today. If you go back to the year that I graduated from college, uh, I remember our classmates uh, setting out for Wall Street and for Silicon Valley. And the feeling that my best friend and I had of wanting to go somewhere different. The path we took was a little less than a path. It was more like I-80. And we followed it all the way to Iowa uh, with our goods packed in the back of a pickup truck until we reached a curmudgeonly farmer's house in rural Floyd County and convinced him to lease us one acre of land on which we could grow food in the blackest dirt that I had ever seen. Like any good Iowa corn farmer, uh, we planted our field in corn. And like any good member of our generation, we followed the cardinal rule of picks or it didn't really happen. America's best kept secret. We don't think of what we're putting into our system. We don't really think about it. Pork, beef, breads, sodas, chicken, french fries, spaghetti sauces, biscuits and with gravy. Everything on your plate is corn. good at something, we ought to be encouraging it. We're good at growing corn, and we're now selling it all around the world. What is this here? That's excess corn. That's what couldn't fit in that huge thing. That's right. Huh. I'm moving from Boston to Iowa. Could I have a big and tasty sandwich? I used to weigh over 300 pounds. Lots of corn means the raw material for an overweight society. Hello, carbs. All that corn goes somewhere. And in fact, a lot of it's going on to our bodies. Whoa. We are growing quality. We're growing crap. Now, in retrospect, we could have made this film infinitely shorter than we actually made it, because uh, it, turns out, it turns out that somebody else had already told the same story we were trying to tell. It was Steve Martin, who back in the 1970s used to do stand-up comedy. And he had a bit where he would uh, conjecture that maybe everything that actually shows up in McDonald's is made out of the same stuff. And if you could go into the back room and peel back the door on the kitchen, you would see this conveyor belt going by with these different molds on it. And you would see this vat full of this stuff. And uh, there would be the cook going, hamburger, french fries, paper box. 
And of course, what Steve didn't really realize at the time is that's actually true. Uh, the hamburger in the typical fast food meal is corn fed. The soda in the typical fast food soda is sweetened with an incredible amount of high fructose corn syrup. And the french fries are quite often uh, fried in corn oil. And pleasingly, even the box now typically has a corn-based wax on the coating. Um, that acre of land that my best friend and I grew in the year after college uh, was not a very big plot. I mean, it's about the size of a football field. But just that one acre produced 10,000 pounds of corn, five tons of food. And that is enough to raise 4,000 corn-fed hamburgers or enough to sweeten 57,000 cans of soda with high fructose corn syrup. We grew just one acre, but America's farmers on the whole grow 94 million acres of corn each year harvesting 14 billion bushels of grain. Agricultural economists track where all of that harvest ends up uh, using a term called corn disappearance. But the reality, if you look around America these days, is that that corn isn't really disappearing. We're each carrying a significant portion of it with us every single day. The reality is that half of all Americans are overweight or obese. And diet-related disease like type 2 diabetes is affecting kids younger and younger. The government's own estimate is that by 2030, when the current obesity generation is all grown up, we will face a $1 trillion annual economic cost related to diet-related disease. Half of that comes in the form of direct obesity-related medical costs, and the other half of it comes in the form of lost economic productivity. And I want to pause on that lost economic productivity for a moment, because it sounds like it's sort of a throwaway. But $500 billion a year is not monopoly money. And it's not actually money that matters. It is the broken dreams of people who attain less education, advance less in their careers, are out sick more at work, and raise families who themselves are at elevated risk of diet-related disease. That lost economic productivity is real people missing out on social mobility. Obesity is fuel for the relentless cycle of poverty. And poverty is fuel for the relentless cycle of obesity. Diet-related disease in all of its forms deepens the systemic inequities that already hold our country back. And it doesn't just discriminate by income. Half of all kids of color are expected to develop type 2 diabetes during their lifetime, a rate 50% higher than white children. In the decades that we have been incentivizing corn production in this country, brewing high fructose corn syrup in our factories and raising corn fed meat on our farms, we've developed a powerful and now deeply ingrained set of food habits. Most of them revolving around a culture of refined grains, added fats and added sugars, processed food and empty calories. Corn in the way we grow and process and consume it looks very little like a vegetable today. Those eating habits get set incredibly young, and they shape us, both figuratively and quite literally, throughout the rest of our lives. I remember the night that we were preparing to harvest our corn in the morning. We decided to lay out sleeping bags between the rows in our cornfield and sleep out under the stars. Our year had passed. My best friend and I had had a grand adventure in the heartland. But ultimately, we were left feeling like we had done little good. The film we had made was going to go off to movie theaters that would show it alongside 72-ounce sodas that people in the audience would be drinking. We wanted, on some level, a chance at a do-over. We wanted to know what we could have accomplished if we had spent our year after college not reinforcing America's broken food habits, but helping to set new ones. 
Not long after I started traveling around to college campuses and giving talks and showing our film, and I was amazed with the number of students who would show up and break with their 21-year-old busy routine of drinking beer and writing code to come out and watch a corn film. First, I realized they were probably thinking they were going to see a porn film, and they were disappointed <laughs> when they got there. Uh, but then, ultimately, I understood why they had come. Food is a prism. And people in this generation recognize what a powerful story food has to tell us. When you peer into that prism of food, you see our nation's greatest challenges refracted. You see human health. You see environmental sustainability. You see the cultural shift away from the dinner table. You see issues of social justice and racial justice in terms of who has access to healthy food. And you realize that maybe somehow, if we could address these issues in our food, that simple, fundamental thing we put in our bodies every day, we might begin to see a roadmap for how we could address those same things across our society. Meeting those students and hearing their passion for creating a more just and healthful and sustainable food system we realized that the do-over we were hoping to have could be had not by us, because we couldn't go back in time, but by other people who wanted to go forward. So with a group of friends, we launched a nonprofit that we called Food Corps. Food Corps is a nationwide team of leaders who connect kids to healthy food in school. Our core members dedicate themselves to a year or two of AmeriCorps service, working hand in hand with community partners across 18 states and hundreds and hundreds of schools to make those schools fundamentally healthier places for kids to eat and learn and grow up in. We have core members from Maine to Mississippi, from California to, yes, Iowa, where we have a team just a few, acre, a few miles from that acre of corn doing simple good work, day in and day out, helping kids fall in love with fruits and vegetables and set new eating habits in place. Our sixth class of Food Corps service members is in the field now. 215 passionate and talented people selected from about 1,000 who applied. Most of them recently wrapped up college or grad school but a number of them were non-college bound or have returned to service as grandparents. The majority of our core members are serving in their home state. Many of them are serving in their home communities, and some are serving in the very schools they themselves attended. I'm honored to introduce you to a Food Corps alum today, Sarah Ting. Sarah served in her hometown of Oakland, where she built school gardens, she taught nutrition lessons to 16 classes a week. And she surveyed and analyzed 145 different California farmers who were supplying food to Oakland Unified Schools to figure out how we could scale up the connection between school children's lunch trays and those local farms and farmers. <coughs> Visiting Sarah in her schools, it was apparent every time just how dedicated she was to the service she was doing. Sarah, what brought you to Food Corps? Thank you, Kurt. Um, you know, so leading up into the this year that I served in Food Corps, I actually had a similar experience being out in agricultural fields, um, in the food system, exploring what it meant right now to, um, to be a part of a food system. But I wasn't a part of my home community food system at the time. I actually was far away in India, working with a trade union of women who were all a part of uh, a collective of informal workers. And many of them were in agriculture. Some were uh, contract farm laborers, and some were street vendors. But what I witnessed there was that there was this amazing power in the collective they had formed and that despite the fact that they had faced enormous struggle and most of the society they 
lived in did not um, consider them to have much power. Um, they came together to work on the issues that mattered to them and form new food systems that nourished their communities. And so that really inspired me to want to go home to join an organization that I could really do the same in my, my own home community. So um, I came back to Oakland and I found Food Corps. And in that service, I really wanted to know what were sort of the historical um, contexts for food in my community. And when I think of that, I think of uh, the Black Panther Party. And many of you might know the Black Panther Party um, is, is from Oakland. Um, but you may not know that they actually had a lot of service programs in the community. And one of them being a school breakfast program for kids. And so, you know, in the midst of the 1960s, there were a lot of school food programs that were rolling out. There were still black children in Oakland that were going hungry. And so the Black Panther Party served thousands of school breakfasts every day to serve the community. And I think that's a great reminder in this context of, you know, we're working in with food inequities that, you know, there's, like the women in India, that there is always this strong leadership and power in community. And in that context, I, I went into my food corps service really wanting to know how can we um, work and be inclusive of communities and their leadership. Um, and work towards a more equitable system with that. And I found that partner in Food Corps and in Oakland Unified uh, School District and figuring out how we could really apply that on the ground. Awesome. Food Corps believes that if we are going to be successful at driving change, it's going to be that we were not the ones who ultimately drove it. Um, Solutions need to be co-created with the communities we're serving, or else they will have no relevance to those communities. Food Corps needs to look different in the Mississippi Delta from how it looks in Detroit, from how it looks in Hawaii, to how it looks in rural Maine, or rural Montana, or rural Iowa. But underneath the difference that makes our country special and the need to adapt our programming to match its place, the reality is that there are also some foundations of evidence that hold true. There are some strategies that are known to be effective at connecting kids to healthy food in school. And if you can adapt those strategies to match the cultural context and the climate in which you're working, then you can really unlock impact. Food Corps worked with a team of researchers at Columbia to develop a framework for our work planning and our impact tracking school by school that is all about finding those things that the evidence shows truly move the needle on kids eating more fruits and vegetables and putting those building blocks in place to create a healthy school food environment. There are things I wanted to share with you today because they're things you can replicate in your children's schools and they're things in many ways you can replicate at home. The first one is that the research makes it very clear that if you want a child to fall in love with healthy food and to begin to choose it, you start by getting their hands in the dirt. For too long, we've treated nutrition education as something where somebody points at a poster on the wall for about 3.4 hours a year in the case of a typical elementary schooler's education, and we expect some good to come of that. It doesn't actually work. What works is getting kids the chance to smell the leaves of a tomato plant, to pull carrots out of the ground and taste them with the dirt still on, and to have the sense of joy and pride and ownership that comes from creating their own plate of food. Researchers will tell you that kids who have a garden eat, on average, one more serving of fruit and vegetables than their peers each day. Kids will tell you something different, which is that gardens are magic. As one student told us, I want to rename our garden the Golden Garden, because when I think of that garden, everything I see turns to gold. Cooking with kids can be magic, too. 
as we heard from a, from a core member of ours in New Jersey recently, dang, Miss Rachel, this, this collared pesto tastes better than cheeseburgers. <laughs> The research also shows that even from a young age, food should not just be about sustenance. It should be about values. By connecting with one child's commitment to environmentalism, we heard from her recently that worms are the only true rock stars to me. <laughs> Most importantly, we need to help kids get over the fear of trying new things. Neophobia is one of the greatest concerns for researchers in the nutrition science field. And for all the effort we put into helping kids develop a growth mindset in the classroom, we fail to cultivate one around the dinner table. For Food Corps, we do taste tests all the time, where we introduce new foods not covering somebody's plate, but just a little bit. And we invite kids to vote in three categories, loved it, liked it, or tried it. I don't see any reason to set the bar lower than that. We know this kind of hands-on discovery really works for connecting kids to healthy food because seven out of 10 kids taught in food core classes shift their attitudes in a positive direction about fruits and vegetables, and the numbers go off the charts for the fruits and vegetables they've really focused on in their lessons. Kids also try new foods in food core and it takes an incredible discipline of trying new foods over and over and over again before you may crack through to that food being one a kid truly loves. The reality, though, is that too many families don't have the luxury or the privilege to do that trying and trying and trying again, because it means throwing out the broccoli that you've worked so hard to buy. That's why Food Corps focuses our efforts on high-need schools, places where kids may not have that opportunity at home, and where we have an obligation to make sure every child has the chance to try and try and try new foods until they learn they love them. Sarah, what was your experience with hands-on education? Yeah, I really appreciate, so I think this point about an environment where the kid, where a kid's growing up is really important. What a child is, is exposed to and what their family is exposed to or the environment that they're growing up in um, can really shape your food choices. So in that way, there's this sort of assumption that we can all choose to eat healthier. But I think um, while food is very a very personal thing, it's something that we associate with love, family, culture, our community. Um, like Kurt has said, it's also something that's now very commoditized, artificial, and something highly marketed to young kids, especially black and brown kids in communities like mine in Oakland. So when you come across this intersection where our food has become something that leads to chronic diseases like diabetes and at the same time leads to food insecurity in my community. Um, there's this real disconnect between children and the personal um, and cultural relationship that they had to food. So what I saw in the garden was where we could really make a space, an environment, a safe green space that kids could just be kids and get their hands dirty. And I saw this when we had um, lessons where we planted radish seeds into the ground. And you could see the wonder on children's faces and see how a seed could grow into a plant. And for some of the kids, that meant trying a radish for the first time. When we harvested them out of the ground, they would say, oh my gosh, what is this? And then would be able to try a brand new veggie that they had never been exposed to before. And then for other students who were very familiar with radishes, for a lot of our students with Mexican heritage, they would say, rabanos? Like, that's what my mom puts in our pozole. That's so cool. I had no idea they came from the ground. And that way, we could make that connection and solidify that personal and cultural pride in the foods that our kids were eating and know that healthy food came straight from their homes. So that was a really great way that our garden could serve so many different purposes. 
Awesome. The second thing you need to do, of course, is figure out how to move from kids liking a taste of something to actually eating a plateful of it. And once you've gotten them interested, uh, that becomes possible. There's a bunch of really interesting behavioral economics research uh, into how you can shift food choices and consumption habits of kids who show up in a school cafeteria or kids who show up around your family dinner table. You can do things like give kids a range of choices so that they feel valued, but make sure those choices are all healthy choices. These are basic design thinking principles you can start to bring to how you reimagine a school cafeteria that in many ways starts to respect children as customers. You can move the salad bar to the front of the lunch line when kids show up with their plates and lunch trays empty. And you can move the unhealthy food to the back of the lunch line when those trays are going to be full. You can pause long enough and observe what's going on in the lunchroom around you to realize something that shockingly few schools seem to realize, which is that kids in the second grade have an incredibly hard time biting into an apple because they're missing their front teeth and realize that if you cut up the apple, suddenly you could change the behavior of the children you're encouraging to eat more fruit. You also can't let junk food companies be the ones who have a monopoly on advertising. Uh, I was talking to somebody recently who had worked for a large processed food company and had been in meetings in that company where they were trying to hatch a plan to increase the lunchroom trading value of one of the foods they were marketing to kids. And if we are not doing anything on the healthy food side to compete with that, we are certainly going to be left in the dust. And the research is clear that you actually can have a huge impact just with a simple change of naming a menu item something engaging and putting a poster behind the salad bar of a superhero eating spinach. Suddenly, kids' behavior starts to shift. Slogans like eat the rainbow actually work. And simple messages like challenging kids to cover half their plate in fruits and vegetables begin to move people in the right direction. Interestingly, the research also shows that kids are responding to the same local food enthusiasm that grown-ups are, or it's possible that actually both of us are tapping into something more innate. The research is clear that kids who are told where a food is coming from and have some reason to care about the farm or the farmer who brought it to them uh, eat more of those healthy foods. Ultimately, though, one of the most powerful things we can do is put people in school cafeterias who serve as role models. People like Sarah, who make healthy eating actually cool, and who let their enthusiasm catch on with kids. And it doesn't just catch on with kids. Pretty soon, idealism and a sense of what is possible catches on with food service directors, too. So far this year, Food Corps service members have introduced 600 new recipes or menu items that are being served at scale in schools and school districts across the country, showing just how possible it is to make this change actually happen in a way that shifts what arrives at a child's plate at lunch. Sarah, you did some cool lunch work in your service. What was that? Yeah, I think um, in shifting the school menu, one of the amazing things that we did at Oakland Unified School District was come in with the assumption that every single child has a history with healthy food. That whether it was the last generation or their ancestors, every single kid comes from a culture that has healthy food at their roots. So what we did with the nutrition services director, Jennifer Labar, and the farm to school supervisor, Alex Emmett, they came together to think about what are the ways that we can help um, the community drive this process to drive the taste buds and uh, the, the flavors that we're going to be trying to appeal to. And so we did this in a couple ways in Oakland. 
Um, the first was to crowdsource the recipes for reforming the school lunch. And that was reaching out to families, to students, to folks in the community to see what are the recipes that you already have in your kitchens um, that have healthy food in them. And then what we could do is kind of work backwards and source those recipes from local, sustainable, um, fair sources. And then second, once we had those recipes and we're developing them, we collaborated with a community organization that had youth leaders do peer-to-peer -peer taste tests so that the youth could decide what they wanted on the school menu, which is incredibly important given that in Oakland, uh, for many students, the school lunch is the majority of calories they're taking in on any given day. So you really need these kids to love the food, right? And so in that way, we were able to both uh, shift the menu so that it was more fresh and local and sustainable, but also reflect the diversity of healthy food and what healthy food really is. It could be from a Mexican dish or a Vietnamese dish, but it really showed our kids that healthy food comes from their roots, and it's not something necessarily new to their culture. Awesome. The last body of work that Food Corps focuses on in our efforts in schools around the country and that all of us really can be focusing on in our communities and our schools is around creating a culture of health. Um, it's the difference, I think, between attending a foreign language class once a week and actually moving to a foreign country and immersing yourself in a place and a people. Um, those 3.4 hours of nutrition education we give a kid, if that's how their nutrition education is bucketed, it will never have an impact able to overcome the same 3.4 hours of TV that they watch every single evening. It has to be an immersive experience. In schools, creating a culture of health means not having healthy food be one person's responsibility. It means you have to catalyze interest from all corners. There's nothing more demoralizing than giving an amazing lesson in the garden and then returning to the classroom and finding the teacher behind their desk with a giant soda in their hands, getting ready to throw candy to kids who answer questions correctly. The culture of health has to transcend the borders of the classroom or the cafeteria as well. It needs to echo through the halls. There needs to be signage. There need to not be vending machines. You should see Let Us Turn Up the Beat badges on kids' backpacks. And ultimately, getting this level of buy-in means that creating a culture of health cannot be the work of one person either. It has to be the work of a team. And Food Corps, in every school we serve, now forms a school team at the beginning of each year, pulls in community members, sometimes kids, a particularly engaged parent, food service director, and works together to co-create our vision for what that healthy school needs to look like by the end of the year. Suddenly that small team has a leadership role, they've got goals for themselves, and by the time they get to the end of the year, they're already setting their sights higher for the following fall. The results of that kind of work, where you build a small team and then you carry the work out to a far larger school and community culture, means suddenly you create momentum. You create a culture that people want to be a part of. I think that's why Food Corps now has 7,000 community volunteers around the country who are joining us side by side, core members like Sarah, to put in place those building blocks of a healthy food environment. And they're doing it in a way that's going to stick. They're doing it in a way that will truly have staying power for the long term. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important piece of the work, that we have to include the whole community in the process. And that was true for me, especially in my community of Oakland, and I think true with other low-income communities of color where folks have been historically excluded from safe spaces, healthy food, from high-quality education. And so it comes as no surprise when some folks feel that they're just not, they don't have a seat at the table when it comes to something as close to home as school lunch. So 
when we think about ways that we can build effective school food programs that are really going to have a high impact in the community, I found that when we invited folks in, when we let the community lead, um, that's where we found the, the results that we were looking for. That's when we're shifting and changing our food system. And so I feel that you know, the work that we're striving to do in Food Corps and, and the work that we were doing in, in my community in Oakland really reflected that, um, that new way of thinking of including all folks at the table, trying to have an inclusive program and an inclusive system um, where we could drive to build institutions that nourish all children. There's a way to do this work that is deeply rooted in the data of what actually moves the needle on kids eating fruits and vegetables, what actually shifts food habits, and to do it in a way that is personal and human and reflective of the cultures we're serving. Food Corps strives to strike that balance of consistency from place to place to build a proof point that can be held up to policymakers and others for replication, while also ensuring that our work is adapted enough to the realities of climate and culture that it truly has relevance and that it truly lasts beyond the time any one core member might serve. Though the beauty of Food Corps is that every single year, as each new class comes on board, there is one more chance for a do-over. There is a chance to do this year's work better than last year's. And we believe firmly that we have to do that, because that's the only way we go from the 500 schools Food Corps serves today to the 100,000 schools across our country not with our program scaling as some kind of widget, but with people around the country learning what works, replicating it in their own places, and us getting smarter and better every single time we try. That's something we believe firmly we have an obligation to do. Food Corps does not exist to do small acts of charity. We exist to solve the problem of our nation's broken food habits, and to solve that problem at the scale at which it exists. And that ultimately is a 100,000 school, 50 state challenge. And we look to people like Sarah and to partners like all of you to make that work possible. Because inside those 100,000 schools are millions and millions of children who deserve to know what healthy food is to care about where it comes from, and to eat it every single day. Thank you. These are the next generation of leaders in food and agriculture. These are the people who are going to make sure all Americans have access to healthy, fair, affordable food grown in a responsible, sustainable way. The thing I'd like to accomplish is at least change the mind of one child about healthy eating and to know that, hey, there's other alternatives rather than fast food. I want to create something that can sustain itself, that can be passed on, something that will last beyond me. We definitely have the power, the sources, the intelligence. So what's stopping us? Um, so one of the big audiences here is parents at Google. Um, and I think that there's a lot of kind of confusion around the, when you're just at the grocery store, whether you're at Whole Foods or like another market or, or whatnot, like what do these terms even mean? And like how do I even make sure that what I'm buying is actually accomplishing the goal of helping my kid eat healthy? So on that note, do you have any kind of, uh, first of all, one thing that you would advise parents to do to better educate themselves so that they know what to feed their kids and how to kind of sort through the, the terminologies and kind of the confusion around the market. And then second of all, um, 
I guess, how do you enforce that, and especially in the Bay Area, where not every kid has access to um, like a backyard or a garden to play with? Awesome. Do you want to take that? Sure. At my first thought when you asking that question is, I think for any family, if you're able to, getting into a kitchen and cooking together. I think about memories that I have growing up with food, and it was those tactile moments of being able to touch the food that you're making or that you're just about to eat. Um, and getting in the kitchen with any sort of fresh produce and making a meal out of it is a really fun thing for kids to do and to learn to love maybe foods that they think that are gross to begin with. <laughs> Um, also, if you have the ability maybe just to have a pot, not even a whole garden, but just a singular pot to plant a few seeds. Um, I remember growing up, my mom would uh, grow just one pot of tomatoes, and I hated tomatoes <laughs> at the time. But every summer, she would plant this one pot of tomatoes, and every summer she made me try uh, a cherry tomato. And I grew over the years to love cherry tomatoes, not necessarily because I naturally had an inclination to love them, but because I had that memory of picking a sun-kissed cherry tomato from the vine with my mother. And so creating those memories, I think, is also really key. Love it. Yeah, if you, you know, a quick guide is, is Michael Pollan's food rules. Um, uh, I don't really like the idea of having food rules that much, I think, like, uh, but those rules are actually really simple. It's just about eating real food, mostly plants, and not too much. Have you guys run into any roadblocks with the schools? Like, when I was kind of looking into it, one thing that I think about is I know a lot of schools have contracts with big companies. Is that something that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, um, the roadblocks are always there and they're always really interesting. I think what I love about the Food Corps model is we have people like Sarah who are very disarming in a conversation with a food service director because she's not a hired gun outside consultant there to tell you you're doing something wrong and she's not a finger wagging upset parent. She's there as a young person who is devoting a year or more of her life to service, to help. And um, I have a colleague who, who served in Food Corps first class, but is now on the, the national staff with us, um, who told me about how during the first six months of his service in northern Michigan, every single day he put on his hair net and his beard net, and he went into the back of the school kitchen, and he said, how can I help you today? And it took six months of doing that before he knew it was safe to say, hey, so I've got an idea for how you could help me. There's local asparagus, local cherries, a bunch of local farmers here in northern Michigan who are eager to start selling to us. How would you feel about piloting that? How would you feel about starting this work together? And the pace of change he was able to achieve by being an ally to a food service worker who has a ton of other responsibilities on their plate uh, was really, really pretty fantastic. So certainly in the Bay Area, I imagine it's not that hard to get parents or schools on board with the idea of healthy eating. But what's it like in other markets? I understand you guys have members all over the country. What's it like in other markets where healthy eating and local food isn't as prevalent of a conversation topic as it is out here? I think one of the things Sarah said is really right and really important, which is every culture has a version of healthy food. and your job is to kind of unearth that and help bring it to life. Our, our sense is um, there's a real risk of an organization like Food Corps kind of airdropping kale around the country and thinking we've done good, uh, when I think actually that, that risks doing a lot of harm. So um, for us, it's about finding the ways to make our work relevant to the food culture of Jackson, Mississippi not imagining that the food culture of Jackson, Mississippi should look exactly like the food culture of Oakland. Super different places. Um, I think uh, it's been really interesting to see how in a number of places what is um, most resonant about the work Food Corps does is that it's about teaching old skills. It's about teaching kids to grow a garden and to cook a meal and to be self-sufficient in ways that are really understood by members of an older generation or members of the older parts of American culture. Um, so we tap into that a lot. And in our, you know, in our work in Montana, we've been really successful with grass-fed beef 
to school and supporting some really cool efforts to make that transition start to happen there. It's because the families in the school are ranchers themselves and are excited to have the chance to sell beef that they've raised on the range in Montana straight into their kid's school and to be able to show up with a horse and show up with a cow and say, look, you know, this is what farming is like. Um, so we're, we're, very, uh, we're very careful to remain above the partisan fray and above the kind of politicization of food uh, because food is meant to be personal and cultural and our job is to kind of help unlock that in a way that is good for kids. We have schools, uh, we have the home. I think also a lot of our relationship with food comes from restaurants that we frequent. Um, what do you see is the role of restaurants in promoting this and what do you think that whether you're a parent or just somebody who loves food, what can you do to kind of send the signal that the restaurants uh, out there in our area should take part in this mission? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's hugely important, especially as our food habits have shifted more towards eating out. Uh, we've got a, a real role for restaurants to play. And you can see it happen quite easily at high-end restaurants where the farm-to-table thing has really gone off the charts in terms of being celebrated and fetishized, maybe a little too far in some ways. Um, I'm most excited to be seeing it happening at restaurants that are down the street from our cornfield in Iowa. Um, you know, really excited about the work Panera is doing up their supply chain um, to make sure they're sourcing food from responsible places and that they're not using additives that they could could use and that a lot of other companies have used. Um, that, that stuff is really important, makes a huge difference. Um, so beginning to push as a consumer to show that you care about those things is really important. One of the challenges Chipotle faces is that um, for all of their efforts to improve the supply chain, every time they do market research, it seems to come back that the consumers aren't actually going there because they've improved their supply chain. And those of us who do go there because they've improved <laughs> their supply chain, I think have a real responsibility to stand up and say, um, hey, like I'm here because you are more responsible than other parties about where you source the food you're serving. So for a while I was carrying around these really annoying business cards in my wallet that explained uh, I did not order meat at this restaurant because your <laughs> meat did not come from a sustainable source. Uh, I would encourage you to check out the following resources to improve your supply chains. It was you know, a little less snarky than that. but uh, the point was the same. I've stopped doing that just because it was too weird. Uh, but I think on some level that is the, the message we all need to be communicating is I'm, I'm making choices for whether I come to your restaurant and I'm making choices then for what I order at your restaurant through a lens of health and sustainability and social justice and values that I care about. Um, hi. So uh, it definitely makes sense why you'd start with kids in, in schools, um, but I'd imagine in high poverty inner city areas, decisions from parents is still something that'd be really hard to change, especially from a price point perspective and whatnot. So I'm curious what you guys are seeing in terms of changes and challenges, as well as what maybe you see ahead for you guys. Awesome. In terms of that arena. Yeah. Do you want to take a first crack? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean. These are large-scale problems that we're talking about. As Kurt was, you know, outlining, these are big national, international-scale issues, and so the solutions that we have to come at the problem with have to be big. Um, but they also, we can do it on this smaller scale in in uh, school food because for a lot of inner-city, low-income areas. Um, school food is one of the primary places where kids get their nourishment for the day. That's an incredibly impactful program, potentially, for kids. So when you're looking at the majority of your calories coming from school food, if we can shift the food products there for kids, um, we can you know, potentially change um, the exposure that kids have to you know, healthier, fresh foods. Um, connect them, reconnect them to their personal and cultural um, relationship to food, and just have the bottom line better nourishment so kids can focus in school and realize their potential. And those are really big things. So I think never underestimating the potential of a school lunch or school breakfast is a way to start. But in terms of the larger cultural and political 
economic forces, there's, yeah, it's a big challenge. Um, but I think, you know, acknowledging that, um, that it is a bigger problem and then coming to your, you know, the parents and um, school administrators and the nutrition services department with that attitude of saying, we know this is bigger than you all. This is not something any one person can carry, but why don't we collaborate and collectively together work on some solutions? I think that's a, a way that we can get some real work done. Yeah, and in terms of where Food Corps is headed from here, um, we have had a really amazing first five years of running this program, and we've grown by leaps and bounds. We went from a startup that nobody had heard of, uh, didn't exist, to a $2 million, $4 million, $6 million, $9 million budget. We're um, heading towards a $12 million budget for the year that's beginning now. Um, we have an amazing national staff team of 35 folks and then 215 core members in the field across the country. And I've talked a fair amount today about our kind of direct program in schools um, because that's really the foundation on which all of Food Corps' aspirations are built. But the rest of those aspirations are, are really real and important for us. Um, the first is, if you take that direct program and you get it strong enough in enough places, you can really prove the impact of having healthy school food environments for kids in a way that will be meaningful for ultimately driving systemic change up here that starts to reach towards the 100,000 school scale at which this problem exists. So you start with the refining our program to really get the impact we're all trying to drive towards. Um, as measured by meaningful shifts in kids' consumption of fruits and vegetables. We're doing a big study with Columbia University research partners right now um, where they're testing school food consumption levels around fruits and vegetables in particular in a bunch of different food core schools across eight states to help build that evidence base. Um, so we can scale that program up and, and need to not only in the places we already work but in like get to critical mass in places that are particularly important to really be operating at a meaningful level across a school district. And then on top of that foundation of direct impact, we have amazing people like Sarah who are going on to lifelong careers in the fields of food and health and equity that have incredible potential to keep shaping this work for the next generation. So already the food service director for all of Fayetteville, Arkansas, that's a Food Corps alum who they loved and created a job for and brought back and then promoted to food service director. Um, here in California, we have senior food service folks in Monterey and North Monterey Unified. Um, so getting our alums on those paths makes a huge difference. Um, second, what can we be doing to um, harness the network of other organizations across the country that are doing this work in partnership with Food Corps and in other ways on their own. How can we get them using a consistent framework, speaking with a common voice, leveraging shared data, and then ultimately together, how can we take the direct impact and use those two networks to amplify it to drive systemic change that's around policy shifts and culture shifts that really help make healthy school food environments the norm rather than the exception. At this point, we are out of time, but I wanted to thank Kurt and Sarah again for bringing great insight and experience to a problem that is very important to our generation and future generations as well. Thank you again, and I'd like to have another round of applause for Kurt and Sarah. Woo!